Thank you. Thanks, Rashi. Thank you so much for the for the presentation. And um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, uh, just listening to Subod talking about uh, you know social discrimination and the impact of uh, um, of of, of uh, our society and the difficulty of our society on our patient um, actually uh, make me think about it made me think about the the important role that uh, these factors also have in the biology of our patient and certainly one of the things I want to do today is give some framework for understanding how kind of the, the society and the environment affect our patient through um, not not only of course kind of cultural and economic uh, factors but also directly to uh, a powerful effect on the body and in particular on the immune system and um, i don't know if the if the slides are um available i was going to let um the organizer present the slide perfect <laughs> so okay excuse me uh, the next one So this uh, kind of slide, if you like, uh, um, give the overarching view of what I'm going to talk about today, which is really the communication between the brain and the immune system. And in fact, the immune systems represent, if you like, also the concept of our of the body. And so the importance that um, biological changes that we can measure in the in 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 the in in the blood or in the you know in, in body compartments of people who suffer from mental disorders, depression in particular, but mental disorders in general, uh, really kind of allows to understand how mental disorders are not just disorders of the mind or of the brain, but disorder of the whole body. And that's certainly one of the topic that the one of the main thing that I want to discuss today. Next one. Now, um, just to give you a little bit of background on me and kind of my academic role within the framework of uh, the interaction between the brain, the body, um, the mind, and, and in particular the immune system. I'm the editor in chief of this journal called Brain Behavior and Immunity. I will show it here because it has a lot of papers that um, are relevant to this audience, um, specifically about the 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 role of the immune system in the context of psychiatry and how the brain and the immune system communicate and how we can use immune biomarkers as a, as a way to stratify and, and even treat of offer new treatment um, to people with mental disorder so a source of a source of reading and of course also a place to submit um, article from the fellow academics who are listening here and the next one now I, I I'm delighted that uh, I, I I you know I've been awarded the psychiatric communicator of the year uh, last year and certainly one of the reasons that uh, that I I received this award was this digital publication called Inspire the Mind, which we launched at uh, Kings about two years ago and then I, about three years ago now and I've been the editor in chief since. And again, I'm showing sure this year because um, it's it's, uh, it's really an opportunity that we have developed for uh, producing um, evidence-based content on mental health. Not only from scientists, uh, but in fact, a lot of uh, a lot of the content, about half of the content, is produced by people with lived experience. So again, an invitation to visit uh, Inspire the Mind on www.inspiredthemind.org. Um, and to contact me where you find a lot of topics, including, of course, the topics that we discuss and discuss in this in this uh, in my talk today, but also any in the audience who's uh, who's really interested in uh, in um, in writing uh, about the experience as a clinician or their own personal experience with mental health, please do do contact me. We really encourage, especially young people, to to find a voice as writers. Thank you. Next one. So this um, editorial that I published uh, a couple of years ago now in Brain Behavior and Immunity really highlight um, the perhaps the, the importance of uh, the field of immunopsychiatry to the broader field of psychiatry. And this is, if you like, a, a recognition, a, 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 almost like an administrative step 
uh, the journal Brain Behavior and Immunity, that for many years since its inception was only considered a journal in the neuroscience and in psychology and immunology field, is now licensed, is now um, cited and, uh, and, and in the category as a psychiatry journal as well. And although you may wonder why this is so important that I decided to dedicate a slide to it, I think it really, sh it really um, symbolized the shift in how the scientific community at large consider the field of immune abnormality in the context of, uh, of, uh, of mental health. It just it gives the recognition that actually the discovery in these areas have a profound impact on, um, on the, uh, can have a profound clinical impact on, on, the, on the people that we see uh, that suffer from mental disorders. And then in fact, most of the, of the topic of, the, of my talk today are about um, describing this biological impact, transforming this biological impact into a clinical impact. Next one. So what, what is immunopsychiatry? Why, is, why have I kind of defined this area of research as the new frontiers? I think the most important theoretical shift that we've accepted, that we've witnessed in the last few years, is this understanding that the immune system is not only um, an army that is out there to, to kind of help us and protect us from virus and bacteria. Of course, it is it is an army that protects us. And with COVID, we have learned so much about the immune system, both the, the, the positive aspect, also the negative aspect of what happened when the immune system overreacted to, to viruses. But certainly, it is more than just that. Next one. And you've seen this slide before because I think it's very clear, and perhaps the, the most important thing that I want all of you to remember is this notion that there is a direct and bidirectional communication between the brain and the immune systems. Now, if you think about the, the top arrow, if you like, the, the, the one on the top, the, the one from the immune system to the brain, well, that's certainly something that we all um, experienced uh, every time we have had a um, fever or flu or cold or COVID, uh, COVID acute infection. Um, because this, this pathway, the one linking the immune system to the brain, is the pathway that explains why during an acute infection we feel tired, we feel grumpy, we feel moody, we feel um, uh, unable to socialize, or certainly lack, we lack motivation to engage in social activity. So a whole host of behavioral changes that are directly caused by the effect of the immune systems on the brain through mediators and molecules that are released by the immune cells and reach the brain to regulate behavior. The, the other arrow, the one from the brain to the immune system, is perhaps less difficult to experience at a personal level, but it's actually equally important and equally frequent because we know now from many, many studies that every time we are exposed to a situation of stress, and our immune system gets activated. This immune system becomes, it's, it's really part of our fight or flight response and is activated together with all the other systems involved in the stress response. So the cortisol, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, other, also the immune system gets activated in situation of stress. Of course, theoretically, the stress uh, could be physical, like you know, in, in the ancestral encounter with a predator, but it also can be psycho psychosocial. So from, uh, for example, in situation of threats or in situation of, uh, of, uh, of high performances. And if you think about it, both these arrows they are, are, have a mixed purpose sense from an evolutionary point of view. The brain, the immune system tells the brain what to do when there is an infection. And it tells the brain to basically stop uh, engaging in, an, in social activity and stop engaging in any activity so that the energy can be saved and used to fight the infection. And also there's almost like a natural social isolation so that people are, there's less of a risk of spreading the infection. And this, the arrow in the, in the, in the, at the bottom, the one from the brain to the immune system, has the evolutionary advantage of preparing the body to fight. Uh, remember, as I said, from, for, for thousands and thousands of years, stress for humans has been the ancestor of stress of the encounter with a predator, where certainly there was a risk of fight, a risk of infection, where you want to have an activated immune system. 
And this mechanism, again, makes sense from an evolutionary perspective and is still present today. Although, of course, today, most of the stressors, not all, but most of our stressors are um, psychosocial. You know, they're all about poverty and social discrimination and unemployment and social isolation rather than encountering an, um, a predator or being a risk of life. Although, you know, the, the, the tragic event that, that are occurring in Ukraine and in many other countries where it is a war at the moment actually remind us that a lot of threats are still physical in our society, unfortunately. Next one. Now, there's two more points, generic points that I want to make, and then I'll, I'll kind of move on and present some data, which uh, or will, will hopefully convince you that what I'm saying is really kind of backed by scientific and clinical evidence. So first of all, there's a, there, the, you know, there's a reason why these areas become so um, popular, both in, with scientists, but also clinicians and even public opinion at the present. The first one is exemplified by this article that was written now a few years ago by a journalist, uh, Nicole Westman. And as you can see, the article specifically says why the next wave of antidepressants may target the immune system. So certainly one of the most important advances in the field have been driven by the notion that we can use the immune system not only to understand more about the pathophysiology of depression, but actually to uh, develop uh, medication or to use existing medication, medication that, that have been developed for infectious diseases or autoimmune disorders in the context of mental health. Because of course, if there is increased inflammation in depression, as I will show you in a second, and if this increased inflammation participates in the pathogenesis of the depressive symptoms, as we can argue based on the communication between the immune system and the brain, then certainly, we can target this increased activation of the immune system for therapeutic purposes, especially in patients who are currently not responding to all available antidepressants. And in fact, I'm going to show you in a few slides, in a, in a few slides that patient, the patients that show the highest level of inflammation are the patients who are more treatment resistant, are the patients who are not responding to currently available medication. And so they are the patients that could benefit from new approaches that target, in this case, the immune system. And the next one. One more point I want to make is that is the reason why this this area is, is resonating not only with scientists and clinicians, but also with the public. And I want to do that through a letter that was written to me by a patient um, who actually is then remained in contact with me and and and, and often advised me on uh, as part of, uh, of of my project and the and the kind of PPI work that they do in my research. Is a patient, as you can see, that looked at, that, that read about my research in The Guardian and wrote to me to say, I've suffered from terrible depression on and off for 20 years. I was interested in your work partly because I would try any other approach because so little is known about what actually causes it. So first point he puts across very clearly, the idea that the immune system is compromised in depression, that the immune system is responsible for at least some of the symptoms of depression is a new idea something that can perhaps explain depression more than the classic theory of serotonin and neurogenic and dopamine that we have had for so many years and then perhaps have not delivered all the advantages, all the all the, 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 the improvement that we, we wished they had. And then the second point, and of course, you know, he also says so little is not about what actually causes it. Um, you know, I, I, I would try any other approach. So if this if this new approach can give new medication, new therapeutic approach, I would try because these are patients that are not helped by current antidepressants. But the second point is even more important. It feels like a physical disease that overwhelms one. And I really like this point because I think as psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health practitioners, especially in, in the Western world, we tend to we tend to give more importance to the kind of sophisticated mind, the sophisticated symptoms of the mind. So for depression, obviously, the sadness, the hopelessness, uh, the guilt, things that are really, you know, appear in the brain. But in reality, patients suffer from a holistic disorder. The patients feel tired, they feel unable to sleep. Um, they feel, you know, they don't have any libido. They, they may not have any appetite or they may have too much appetite. So for them, there's a physicality of it that, that is really important. And 
the fact that we can measure things in the body, that we can look at mechanism operating in the body, that we can actually do blood tests, if you like, in the body, is something that allows the patient to frame depression and mental disorders in general as a disorder of the whole body, and it, which kind of makes makes sense, which makes more sense from an interpretation of the symptoms. And I think that's that's why this, this approach is, as I said, been recognized and embraced by many patients as well. The next one. So let me start with some studies, um, and I'm just going to use key, key of some key studies that I've produced in the last few years to give really snapshot example of why, of what do we know about this field? So this one, which was actually published last year, using is a study in which we measure C-reactive protein. Um, C-reactive protein is an inflammatory biomarker is classically used in metabolic disorders and cardiovascular disorders because it has a very easy, first of all, can be done in any in any hospital. I'm sure a lot of people who listen to this has been have CRP measured for one way, well, for one reason or another. I said they had my CRP measured only a, a month ago as part of a, of a clinical check. Um, so it's easy to measure, it's, but also it's, it's, we have values that have a clinical meaning. So we know, for example, that at some point, about three milligram, uh, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disorders. At 10 milligram uh, per liter, 10 milligram per liter, there is a possibly an acute infection going on. At 100 milligram per liter, there is, six, there is, a, there is a risk of sepsis. And I've seen a result of COVID patients, especially during the acute phase um, before the vaccination kick started, uh, hospitalized patients with hundreds and hundreds of, of, of milligram per liter of CRP. <coughs> Excuse me. Next one. So what do we know about depression and inflammation? And this study really almost kind of epitomized everything that we know. This is actually a, a, a huge study, it had 80,000 patients. Uh, sorry, 80,000 participants, about 30,000 patients, about 50,000 healthy controls. Because as you, for those of you who are familiar with the UK Biobank, it's one of the largest database of, of, of clinical information in the world. And if you look at the pictures on the left, it kind of almost shows what we know about inflammation. Because as you can see, the green column represents the level of CRP uh, in healthy controls, and the red color, the orange color, represents the level of CRP in healthy con in, in patients with depression, with lifetime history of depression. And as you can see, and of course on the on the x-axis are the diff are the different threshold of CRP. So zero to one is the lowest level. There's basically no inflammation at all. One to three is the beginning of inflammation. Three to five, while well, above three, as I said, is increased cardiovascular risk, so inflammation will start becoming, it's called low grade, but it's clinically significant. It's equivalent to what you would have if you have diabetes or, or cardiovascular disorder, even at the kind of, so in, at the time where your, where your illness is under control. Five to 10 and then above 10 indicates then um, more intense inflammation, as I said, or acute inflammation. And as you can see, you can almost see this shift to the right. Uh, occurring across this large population of healthy control and depressed patient. So in zero to one, more controls than depressed patients are in the category zero to one. You can see the, the green column is higher than the red column. One to three, there's a shift, so the two columns become equally high. And then once you start moving above three milligram, I repeat the threshold for inflammation, uh, clinically significant inflammation, you can see the more depressed patient than controls are in that category. So that there is a higher, the column is, is higher, is taller. Um, we can measure, of course, the level of the number of people, the percentage of people who CRP above three, so CRP indicating low grade inflammation, which is higher in the press participant, around 20%, 21%, then control, which is around 17%. And of course, we, as we would imagine, higher CRP, so higher inflammation is associated with age, but also with sex, with BMI, with smoking, and socioeconomic status and physical health. And this is actually as I said, one of the mechanisms through which psychosocial adversity and an adverse social environment can actually affect both mental and physical health by um, creating a condition that increases inflammation in our body. Next one. <coughs> okay, now this may seem a complicated table, but I'm going to uh, walk you through. I want you first to look at the top left uh, green line. 
which indicates the association between depression and CRP in this large population of around 80,000 people. Now, it's positive, it's highly significant, you can see the p-value. So it basically confirms that yes, depressed patients have higher level of CRP. Now, if you move from left to right, you start ad adjusting for age and sex and also smoking and BMI. So adjust for the effect, if you like, of behavior and metabolic abnormality that are due to behavior. Arguably, BMI is dictated by a combination of you know, nutritional habits, um, physical exercise, sedentary lifestyle. So you adjust for all the all these all the effects. And smoking, of course, is, is you know is, is a behavior that affects inflammation through a direct damage of the lungs. So these are you know moving from left to right, adjust for uh, behavior that can have an effect on inflammation, and moving from top to bottom, adjust for trauma score, so an experience of childhood, in, of, of experience of stress, especially in childhood. We know that exposure to stress in childhood has a profound impact on the immune system. It creates a persistent state of inflammation. That's something we've been learning now for almost 20 years. But it also adjusts for socioeconomic status. And again, we know that poverty and low socioeconomic status tends to increase inflammation through our contribution of both environmental and personal factor. And of course, at the bottom, uh, adjust also for health status. The more ill health, the more, co more comorbidity with medical disorders, the higher inflammation. So the bottom line, the bottom green line on the right is the most adjusted association possible. And you can see that even after all this adjustment, the p-value is still significant, the beta-value is still positive. So there is still an association between depression and inflammation. And I think that's a key factor because what it demonstrates in this table is that the increase in inflammation and depression is not due to confounders, due to lifestyle, uh, socioeconomic adversity, or physical health. Part of it it is, but part of it is a core essential biological abnormality that persists in depression after all this adjustment. And again, it reiterates the concept that is, we're really discussing about something that is part of the biology of depression and is present in all depressed patients. It is not just explained by confounders. Next one. Now, I've demonstrated an association between depression and inflammation. I've demonstrated that this is exp not explained by confounders. It's part of the biological characteristic of the patient. But who are the depressed patients that are particularly inflamed? Next one. So this study that I've been presenting now is a study that uh, examined CRP in a large group of depressed patients. So now this is a clinical population, not a, not a community sample, but a clinical population of depressed patients categorized for being treatment responsive, to be treatment resistant, and to be untreated. The treatment responses were on antidepressant, but they were feeling well. The treatment resistant were on antidepressant, but they were feeling depressed. And the untreated were depressed and not on antidepressant. In this case, we use BMI corrected CRP. So we adjust for BMI because, of course, although as a confounder, it does not explain all of the inflammation. It certainly has an effect. So we wanted to take to adjust for that as a confounder. You can see, obviously, this is a much smaller sample. We're talking about hundreds of patients rather than thousands, like in, uh, in the other samples. So the power to detect difference is not as strong. Yet, we can clearly see that for treatment-resistant depressed patients, the subgroup that is currently on antidepressant and not responding, there is a clear statistically significant increase of CRP, BMI-corrected CRP, compared to the healthy volunteers. If you just look at the data, you can probably see that both the treatment responsive and the untreated actually have a higher level and numerically higher level. So as I said, the distribution of inflammation that is present across all depressed patients, but certainly those with treatment resistant are the ones that are most more depressed. Next one. So where is this depression? Where is this inflammation coming from? I have mentioned before in the previous slide that one of the factors that are certainly associated with this increased inflammation and depression is early exposure to, to, uh, life, uh, to life stressors, maltreatment, 
um, physical abuse, uh, neglect, uh, in both emotional and physical neglect. And there are now hundreds of studies on this topic. And, and in a way, I've, I've shown you the effect of, of, um, of childhood maltreatment already before, when I've shown you that, yes, it is associated with increased inflammation, but doesn't explain it all. However, something that we have been particularly interested in over the last um, few years, and we're the first to describe, is kind of going beyond childhood maltreatment, or if you like, earlier than childhood maltreatment, the next one. And in particular, we've been looking at exposure to stress in utero, or if you like, exposure to maternal depression in pregnancy. As, a, as, a, as again, um, a, a model or, or a potential mechanism explain the increased inflammation in depression. We know from many epidemiological studies that exposure to depression in the perinatal period in general, but in depression in particular, creates a trajectory of risk so that offspring born from mothers who were depressed in pregnancy tend to have a higher risk of developing mental health problems themselves when they become adolescent and young adulthood. Uh, court studies in, in, in OUSPAC, for example, or the South London Child Development Studies, including some of our own papers, demonstrated this. So I wanted to test the hypothesis that perhaps this part of this risk is due to the fact that the, ch the child is exposed to um, inflammation in utero. So it's exposed to the possibility to expose an environment that creates a trajectory of activated immune systems. The next one. And we've published this and many other paper on this topic, which again, you can uh, you can look and read if you're interested in this topic in the next one. <coughs> Excuse me. But this is the key finding that I want to emphasize. And again, you know, the details of the table, which, which is, of course, is complex, but I'm going to kind of walk you through. And I want you in particular to focus on the four pro-inflammatory biomarkers that are um, highlighted in red. Because these are cytokines, so these are molecules that are released by our immune cells to, um, to uh, affect, to, to kind of regulate the immune system, but also affect the brain. And you can see that all of the four, all of these four immune biomarkers are ele elevated in patients with depression. These are now we the women, depressed patients, depressed women pregnant, who are compared to mother who are depressed and they're not, who, sorry, who are pregnant but they're not depressed. And, uh, and so one, certainly one thing that I want to propose is that this early exposure to inflammation in utero can create a trajectory of activated immune system that persists um, into adulthood and participate to this increase in inflammation. Next one. So, as I said, an increased activation of the immune system and a trajectory of risk. They explain the trajectory of risk. Next one. But I want to use the last five minutes of my talk to um, to present, if you like, the the the, the most the most clear in clinic, clinical impact of the research. First, how we can use immune biomarker to understand. Um, the outcome of our depressed patient, and second, how can we use the immune system to intervene? So in this study that we published a few years ago now, we used two immune biomarkers, a macrophage migration inhibitor factor, or MIF, and interleukin 1-beta, to before starting, an anti to measure inflammation before starting the antidepressant treatment. And then we asked the questions, can we use inflammatory biomarkers to predict who will and who will not respond to antidepressant treatment? Next one. So as you can see in this slide, we can actually use these two biomarkers, IL-1 and MIF. And through a combination of the values of these biomarkers, we can, we can accurately predict those who respond to treatment, respond to antidepressant treatment. These are the, the, the green patients, if you like. These are the ones that are able to respond, all of them, 100%. The patients who have the lowest level of inflammation, 100% in the, of, of this patient in the study respond to a standard antidepressant. But also we can identify the, in, the, in the bottom right corner, the red group of patients. So those 33% of patients who are treatment resistant 
and they are not going to respond to currently available medication. None of them actually in this study respond to a standard antidepressant. And with some people in the middle having a, a kind of 50-50 chance of responding. Now, the numbers make perfect sense. We already know that about only 45 to 50 percent of patients are actually really good responders to an antidepressant. They respond immediately to the first one. And we know that about a third of the breast patients are treatment resistant. So, although, of course, these are just studies at the beginning and there are studies that are in kind of limited to, to, a, to, a, to a, a research population, imagine what it could mean if in the future we could use a blood-based biomarkers, not necessarily these two uh, biomarkers, maybe another immune biomarker or something related to the immune system, they rather they can tell us who will respond to treatment, who will not. So they can tell us before months and months of trial and error that, for example, a patient is green, a patient, a patient will respond to whatever antidepressant is prescribed. And so if you like, it's, it's low risk and can be prescribed and can be successfully treated. But another patient is red, someone that is not going to respond to an antidepressant, maybe not even to a second antidepressant, so should be perhaps fast-tracked into treatment using augmentation strategies or, or even adding an anti-inflammatory. So potential clinical impact, nothing that we can now routinely use in the NHS, but certainly the idea of bringing personalized medicine early in psychiatry, something which we have not been able to do yet, uh, as in other fields of medicine. And then the next one slide, next slide. And um, another couple of points I want to make. Um, although the data I've shown you for depression, they're equally important for other mental disorders. This is a paper we published a few years ago now showing the high level of inflammation equally predict the lack of antipsychotic response in first of psychosis. Next. Here you can see uh, another pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, that is elevated um, in the black column. So these are high, much higher level of inflammation in patients at first episode psychosis at the onset of the first episode before starting antipsychotic treatment. This higher level of interleukin six predict lack of response to antipsychotic medication. So personalized medicine in mental health, not only in depression but across all disorders. And finally, the next one. I'm, also, I'm now going to show you data from a recent clinical trial that we've published where we use minocycline, which is a, an anti-inflammatory medication. It's an antibiotic, but also has a powerful anti-inflammatory effect as an augmentation strategy. So we've done exactly what we have hypothesized that would have a clinical effect. We've chosen patients that were not responding to antidepressant. We have chosen patients who had a higher level of inflammation. We have given them an anti-inflammatory together with the current available antidepressant, to the antidepressant they were taking at the time, to which they were not responding. And the results, the next one, show exactly how therapeutically beneficial this intervention can be. So let me just walk you through these slides. The color on the left, the one label CRP plus N, this is the delta score, so that's the improvement of depressive, depressive symptoms over the four weeks of the clinical trial as measured at the Hamilton 17 uh, scale. Uh, that's a delta, so that's a score. So the group that had the highest improvement, 12 point difference between the baseline and four weeks treatment, are the group that were, had a high level of CRP, so had a clear inflammation as demonstrated by CRP above three, and were on minocycline, so received the anti-inflammatory medication. The next group is the, the, the one the CRP plus P, is the group that had inflammation but received placebo. And as you can see, there is no therapeutic effect, as you would imagine, because of course, this is not a placebo effect, it's driven by the anti-inflammatory medication affecting this, the immune mechanism relevant to depression. But the most interesting comparison is the third column, the CRP minus minus N. These are the people that have low level of CRP, so they are not inflamed and they receive minocycline and they don't show clinical improvement. So it clearly, the, stu the study clearly says that for the subgroup of people with high level of inflammation, adding an anti-inflammatory medication is therapeutically beneficial. And of course, the last group on the right is the group that has no inflammation and is on placebo and again, doesn't improve. So with my last slide, 
I really want to emphasize that we move, we are moving, or we already moved from the, the from the from the time of research and science uh, into the time of clinical of clinical application and clinical impact, if not yet clinical practice. We have biomarkers data. We have proof of concept study with clinical trials. We're ready to bring personalized medicine to mental health to improve the treatment of the patient, especially the treatment of people that are currently not responding to the medications that are available. And with this, I really hope that I've convinced you that we are in an exciting time for biological psychiatry and for immunopsychiatry in particular. Thank you so much.